I'm Harriet Vanceful, and I'm delighted to be here at ACC 2023 and welcome Professor Steve Nissen, who is here to present the late breaking clinical trial results from the Clear Outcomes trial. Welcome, Professor Nissen. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Um, I wonder if you could start off by telling us the context, um, the problem of statin intolerance, and what you were aiming to achieve with your trial. Well, first of all, uh, let's be clear. Statins are the cornerstone of uh, LDL-lowering therapy with you know, just mounds of evidence over decades on their efficacy, not only in lowering cholesterol, but in reducing the complications of high cholesterol, such as myocardial infarction, stroke, and death. However, uh, the literature and our own experience suggests that somewhere between 7 and 29% of people who attempt to take statins have adverse effects. And in many of them, the adverse effects, typically myalgias, muscle pain, are sufficient that they cannot take the drugs. And physicians try alternative statins, but there is a significant fraction of the population that will tell us we cannot tolerate a statin. We needed to have a therapy that we could use to treat those patients with proven benefits on adverse cardiovascular events. And along came bempedoic acid. And bempedoic acid is an interesting drug. It's a prodrug. It works in the same pathway as statins, but upstream of statins, but it is not active when administered orally. It take, gets taken up by the liver where it's converted to an active form. Since it's not active in peripheral tissues, it really doesn't cause muscle pain or any of the other adverse effects that patients on statins complain of. But all we knew until now is that bempedoic acid could lower LDL cholesterol. So we designed the Clear Outcomes trial, very large global trial, to determine whether or not bempedoic acid could produce the kind of benefits we saw with statins, but without the adverse effects. What was your primary hypothesis? Well, the primary endpoint of the trial was a four component composite of myocardial infarction, stroke, coronary revascularization, and cardiovascular death. However, we designed the trial so that we could sequentially test other endpoints. And as long as we achieve statistical significance, we could move through those endpoints. So the first secondary endpoint was three component MACE that didn't include coronary vascularization, just the heart events, then myocardial infarction, uh, then coronary vascularization, and so on. And this enabled us to test the efficacy of the drug for reduction of several different adverse cardiovascular events. Okay, um, so a two group parallel individual level randomization with the primary endpoint that you mentioned and hierarchical testing of the secondary endpoints, really robust design. Who did you include in the trial? So patients had to complain of uh, intolerance to statin, meaning a side effect, an adverse effect that occurred when they started the drug that went away when they stopped it. Uh, we Almost all the patients had failed at least two statins. In a few patients, they'd only failed one statin, but they were recommended by their physician not to attempt a statin again. You can imagine if somebody had you know, rhabdomyolysis from a statin, their doctor wasn't going to try another drug. So that constituted the population. For this trial to be appropriate and ethical, we required the patients to sign a statement and their providers that they understood that statins reduced the risk of heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular death, but that they simply were unable to tolerate a statin. And everybody in this trial had to sign that statement. Obviously, it was very 
challenging, but we were able to do it because we had 1,250 sites in 32 countries around the world uh, that were enrolling patients. And we were successful at enrolling these patients in spite of the pandemic. Would you go over the baseline characteristics of your patients with us? Yes. Um, uh, they were almost equally balanced amongst men and women. There were 48% women, which is a very unusual in a trial. And I'm very pleased that we were able to do that because it gives us robust information about the efficacy of benpidoic acid in both genders. Uh, they had high LDL cholesterol because they couldn't take a statin. So the median LDL cholesterol was 139 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, there was a pretty good fraction of patients that had diabetes, 45% or so. And uh, otherwise, they looked typical. Now, one other nuance is that we did allow both secondary prevention patients and high-risk primary prevention patients. So we had uh, people that had a previous event, that was about 70% of the patients, but 30% of the patients had high-risk characteristics, such as diabetes, um, smoking, there were a variety of other factors that would allow us to enroll those patients because their risk was high enough to warrant uh, inclusion. Right, so risk-enriched population that would allow for precise treatment effects. Um, what was your primary treatment effect? So uh, first of all, we had a lot of endpoints. We had over, over 1,700 primary endpoints, so very, very robust. The hazard ratio for the four-component MACE was 0.87, 13% reduction, for the more rigorous three-component MACE was actually better. Uh, it was 0.85 or 15% reduction. In both cases, these were highly statistically significant. So there was no, these were not marginal results. They were very significant results. Because we uh, had a positive result with a statistically significant result for the primary and the first secondary endpoint, we were able to move to the third endpoint, which was myocardial infarction. And for myocardial infarction, the hazard ratio was 0.77, a 23% reduction. And then we moved in the hierarchy to coronary revascularization, and the hazard ratio was 0.81, a 19% reduction. And then finally, the fifth endpoint, stroke, had a hazard ratio of 0.85, but it did not reach statistical significance so that we stopped testing the hierarchy at that point. And how did you split the alpha uh, between them? When you do a hierarchical testing, uh, you do not have to adjust the alpha because uh, the way this is designed, you cannot move to the next endpoint unless you have statistical significance on the first endpoint. This is now increasingly used. Uh, the journal statisticians were very comfortable with the approach. So you maintain the study-wise alpha at 0.05, but you must stop. So if we had failed on the, the first secondary endpoint, the first key secondary endpoint, we could not have tested any further. But we were we, we ordered the endpoints what we thought was a logical way, and it turned out that we got it right. Okay. Um, what about the adverse effects? Uric acid, gout, and other relevant Absolutely. adverse effects? There were, there were adverse events. Let me tell you some of the things that didn't happen. Unlike statins, there was no increase in diabetes, which we were obviously think is very important. Uh, there was a increase in gout is about 1% uh, compared with placebo. There was also an increase in cholelithiasis, uh, also about 1%. Now, there was a slight increase in creatinine, but we expected that because bempedoic acid 
reduces renal tubular excretion of creatinine. It doesn't actually worsen creatinine clearance. It simply affects the, uh, the excretion of creatinine. So we had a very, very small increase in creatinine levels. The withdrawal rate for adverse effects was the same between the bepidoic acid and placebo groups. Uh, myalgias, which of course is how patients got in the trial, were very similar and quite uncommon in both groups. And so the safety was, uh, was good. Uh, the known safety issues like gout did come up and the new uh, ob observation of cholithiasis also it will be reported in the manuscript. What about co-interventions, other lipid therapies? Were they equally distributed between the groups? They were not. Uh, the placebo group got more uh, additional therapy than the bepidoic acid group. And so here's how, here's what happened. At six months, we had about a 22% reduction in LDL cholesterol in the bepidoic acid group. That gradually narrowed over the course of the trial as placebo patients, some of them got PCSK9 inhibitors, various other therapies. And so there was a gradual reduction in the difference. We, uh, we saw this a very robust reduction in cardiovascular events in spite of the convergence of the LDL curves between the two arms. But clearly the more efficacy from the bepidoic acid group compared with the placebo group was maintained at a high enough level that events were reduced. And of course, you tested this intervention among statin intolerant patients. Trial results are often generalized beyond what the trial tested. Um, do you think there might be a role for bempedoic acid as add-on therapy uh, in patients who are on statins but have elevated levels of LDL despite maximum tolerated doses? I think there is certainly a potential role for the drug there. Now, let me also make it clear that you could get in this trial if the most you could tolerate was a dose of statins below the lowest approved dose. So some of these people would be on, you know, 10 milligrams of atorvastatin three days a week, something like that. And you could get in the trial with this, these very, very low doses of statin. So we had some statin use. I do think as an add-on, uh, the drug could be used. Uh, it clearly has the most utility in statin intolerant patients. I want to say once again, however, that in high-risk patients that tolerate statins, maximal treatment with statins is the first line. But if you get to maximal treatment and you still need a, a little bit of additional lowering, then bempedoic acid might be a good choice. Some of those patients are going to get a PCSK9 inhibitor, but these are you know, much more powerful drugs. They're given by injection. They're, it's hard to get payers to pay for them. So, you know, I think there is a role here, but I think the real sweet spot for bampedoic acid is the patient that doesn't tolerate adequate amounts of statin to get their LDL where you want it. Who would you not offer this therapy to? I would say that somebody that has really active gout, uh, you know, I'd be a little bit reluctant to treat them. Uh, somebody that had a, an attack a few years ago is now on allopurinol, their uric acid is down, I wouldn't worry. But somebody that's got active gout, particularly if they don't tolerate allopurinol, and there are some people like that out there, uh, I think those would be people you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to treat. I would not treat patients who uh, have the ability to take adequate doses of statins. You know, someone that's on a low dose of statin and has not been tried on a higher dose, that would not be, in my view, a good choice here. The first choice would be to increase the statin dose. And if that, if they can't tolerate the increased dose, well, then obviously it would be reasonable to consider bempedoic acid. 
Well, let me congratulate you on this practice changing trial um, and your presentation at ACC, as well as the publication in the New England Journal of Medicine, which we can't wait to read. We are grateful for the generosity of your time this morning, Professor Nissen. Thank you. And I am grateful for the 14,000 patients that were willing to, to take a drug when they know they might have gotten a placebo and stay with us for up to five years. You know, we all really owe a great debt of gratitude to patients who volunteer for clinical trials. And these patients were extraordinary and they stayed with us for the trial. We had vital status on 99.4% of them and they had full follow-up in 95% of the patients. Quite extraordinary in the middle of a pandemic. Absolutely, and thank you for that beautiful reminder of who is at the center of everything we do, um, and also the folks who volunteer to make the rest of our work possible. Thank you, Professor Nissen. Indeed, thank you.